Hi everyone, this is Elias Martin from CollectingJapanesePrints.com. Um, welcome to Woodblock Wednesday. This is a uh, very late edition of Woodblock Wednesday. I usually um, do these live broadcasts at 1 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. Uh, but I haven't done a Woodblock Wednesday video in about a month. Um, it's been kind of a busy month. Uh, I, I, there was... Um, I had some travels uh, for work. I went to Art Basel, Miami for the art shows. I was sick. I did a little bit more travel. And then just busy with the holidays. So I just thought this being sort of the first week back for everyone, um, I thought, why not start uh, the Woodblock Wednesday series again um, this week? So... Uh, I'm doing that. I'm happy to be back. And I want to thank all of you for your support, uh, your questions, your comments, sharing my videos. Um, you know, so uh, thank you. And of course, for watching them. Um, so I've had a really wonderful um, welcoming from different communities, different print um, collecting communities on Facebook and other places where the video has been shared. And so thank you for, again, for so your support. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, in order to make these videos what you would like uh, or, or answer questions that you might have, feel free to comment and, and, question, and send out questions either under the videos themselves or you could private message me with questions you might encounter on collecting Japanese prints. And uh, I'm being happy to answer them. I might even turn uh, the, the questions into uh, a video in, in the future. I often do that. So I wanted to start off the new year Sort of to recap the last few weeks that I, you know, mentioned, uh, you know, I was traveling and I've noticed some interesting things. Um, you know, I went to Art Basel and I saw that craziness with the banana with the tape on the, on the wall and and you know what to make of this uh, the art market, especially when uh, pieces are selling for. I mean that that work I think sold for one hundred twenty thousand dollars you know, banana taped to a wall. You know, of course that's conceptual and there's a there's a there's certainly a place in the art world for conceptual art. I mean, of course, you know, the, the, there's that. And I don't want to wax poetic about the art market and, and why those things are happening. The What I will say is this, the market is very large and there is room for everyone. And just because there's a banana being sold um, in a contemporary art fair for $120,000 doesn't mean that the entire market has gone crazy. There's wonderful artwork to purchase out there for the right price. Uh, and if you're, if you're interested in collecting prints, um, particularly Japanese prints, uh, the advantage is to the buyer because there's a lot of prints out there. There's a lot of prints out there for a, for a variety of prices. You could spend you know, 500 to a thousand dollars on a really fine quality print. You could also spend tens of thousands of dollars on a fine quality print, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the, the Japanese print collecting community is vast and there are people who with deep pockets, but there are also people who, who are just casual collectors who, who want something beautiful on their wall or want to have a few fine prints with a historical sort of, um, with a historical perspective, with a historical um, uh, importance. So today, I want to I want to start off the talk with giving some tips, further tips to collectors who are interested in um, collecting Japanese prints. And I also have a treat today. I have an original printing uh, of a Hokusai Great Wave, arguably the most important, most iconic uh, print produced in Japan's history. And it's an original printing. It's actually not just original, but a, a, an earlier type of printing. And I'll sit down with all of you. We'll, we'll look at the print and compare other impressions that we can look at in, in books. Uh, but before we get there, I just wanted to comment um, a little bit on, on, the, on, on, on collecting. And, um, you know, to, how to be a successful collector or how to collect um, in a really savvy way so that you could at least um, uh, buy the, the right kind of pieces that will reward you um, over, the, over the years. 
And before I was a dealer, I, I was a collector. I've been collecting for over 20 years and I've learned quite a few things. Uh, number one, when I first started collecting, my enthusiasm really uh, sort of pulled me in many directions and I bought a lot of things. And though the things I, were, I was buying at the time um, were interesting to me, over the course of a couple years, my interest sort of waned and those pieces sort of just became kind of things that helped me move my attention or focus elsewhere. So, you know, one of the things I tell uh, collectors early on in their collecting careers is, is just, first of all, buy books, buy references that allow you to become familiar with the particular artist that you're interested in so that you don't spend a lot of money on prints that w were enticing in the moment, but then you see something else that you didn't expect and, uh, and then you, there's something else to buy. And at the very least, then you have to raise more money to buy something else. If you had you saved your money, you would have been able to buy the, the print that you really want sooner. And, you know, and of course, in, in the end of the day, if, if you follow that pattern, it'll save you a lot more money. And besides, uh, besides buying books, which are important, I mean, there's a, every collector needs a small reference library, um, a library based on monographs of the particular artists, as well as an area. So books on ukiyo-e that show uh, artists from within that genre. So you could see works by Hokusai, by Hiroshige, uh, Konosada, or even older works, Utamaro, Shiraku, all those artists. Um, you know, that will help you develop your eye in, in um, that particular field. Same thing for Shinhang and Sosakuhanga. Um, but also besides reference books, familiarize yourself with uh, museum catalogs and museum holdings. So, for example, at the Art Institute of Chicago, I live in Chicago, they have an amazing image database where you could just log in, you know, and, or I don't know, you don't even have to log in. You just go on to their site and you type in the artist's names that you're interested in and you get all these images. That is... In, in essence, is a reference library that you have at your disposal. You get to see prints that are pretty large scale on the screen. You get to examine them. Now, you don't have the information um, other reference books will provide. Valuable essays by leading scholars are always important, of course. But the images themselves in reference books sometimes can be kind of tiny or the reproductions of the images in the books can uh, be lacking, particularly if you're buying older reference books where the images are black and white. So having these images um, online basically free uh, is great. So familiarize yourself with what, which museums in the world contain prints or possess prints or you know, promote prints that interest you. So, not every museum has the same focus. Some museums have more of a 20th century focus, where others ha are more of an ukiyo-e uh, focus. So you, you want to become familiar with those. There's some, the world's top museums, have an amazing collection of all of the genres. So, you know, I encourage you to have a look. And number three, uh, when you do start buying prints, um, I recommend buying the best quality uh, prints you can. Um, in fact, if you could stretch your budget so that you're, you know, you, you may be paying more than you expected, but you're getting something that is of the highest quality or as, 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 as high as you could afford, maybe you're pushing it a bit more, so that you, you ensure that the, the piece is quality, of course, and then if that day comes when you decide to sell it, then the market always rewards um, a collector for quality and rarity. So if, for example, if you were buying a Hokusai print, you want to buy one that's uh, for, of an impression that's earlier um, and also of a design that's, that's stronger. You know, if you just want a Hokusai and it doesn't matter which one, okay, there will be choices out in the marketplace for that. But if you have a specific design, you want to hold out for one 
whose impression is sharper earlier and the condition overall is, is, is better. And that way, again, when you decide to sell it, you'll be rewarded. Uh, the l impressions, particularly Hokusai, but other ukiyo-e prints, there's a lot of them out there. And um, especially the ones that are faded or they're kind of late impressions, you, those you can find any time. And the reason why is that they don't sell as well. And, um, and that will always be. You know, it was like that when I first started collecting 20 years ago. It will be like that 20 years from now. So you, you really want to focus on quality. Um, now, I understand there's, there's collectors out there that want to just buy a few prints that, to decorate their, their walls and then just kind of maybe buy a few more that they could just kind of look at. Okay, um, that's fine. You know, and reproductions are okay if that's what you're thinking of doing or later reprints. But you have to understand when you buy a reproduction, you're never going to get your money back. It is primarily a decorative um, sort of object, and it's just, it's like fancy wallpaper. You put it up on your wall in the frame, and if you pay $100, well, and you keep it up on your wall for like a year or two, or maybe 10 years, well, you know, you got what you, you know, what you paid and more. But you'll never be able to resell a reproduction or a later restrike, because they keep making them. You know, so why would someone want to to pay three to five hundred dollars for a reproduction that's twenty years old if they can buy one, you know, in in the Rita Airport for one hundred and fifty or two hundred dollars? You know, it just depends. They keep, they keep making them more, and it seems like every year they're cheaper and cheaper. So reproductions and restrikes, you know, again they're decorative, and you'll never get your money back, but. That's, if that's not your intent, and your intent is just for something beautiful on your wall, fine. Uh, but today's topic is uh, more in line with uh, collectors who are interested in the very best and who are connoisseurs. And, you know, I want to talk about um, particularly Hokusai today. Most of my Woodblock Wednesday videos are about 20th century prints. It's certainly an area that I enjoy uh, collecting and, and offering on my website, but I also sell, sell ukiyo-e. And so today is a great day to be able to discuss that. It's the beginning of the year, and the best way to start a conversation on ukiyo-e is to have a fantastic great wave. So without further ado, let's go to the table and have a look. So the lighting in my apartment is uh, much more dramatic and it's darker because of the time of day. Now it's evening here in Chicago and normally when I do my Woodblock Wednesdays, it is midday. So the lighting here hopefully should be okay, but it might be a little off compared to other videos. So I just wanted to point that out. But this is an original printing uh, of Hokusai's most, one of his most famous works, uh, The Great Wave. And the, the print here uh, that I have is a really wonderful, fine example. And I'm going to zoom in so you could see the print. I'll, I'll be quiet for a moment or two so that you could really uh, take it all in. So the, there you have it. It's really a, um, a treat to have here uh, at, at my gallery, which also is my home, um, to be able to show this print, an original great wave up close. You know, usually in museums, you see them behind glass. Uh, of course, there's some fine galleries throughout the world where, you know, the dealers have had these, and, but usually they do exhibitions and you see them framed behind glass. And here... 
you know, I want to really zoom in so that you could see the fine printing of this impression. Now, what's interesting, and uh, we'll come back to the, the original print, is I have two reference books here out. Um, one is Hokusai and Hiroshige. Um, and I picked this one for a reason. Uh, I picked both of these for a reason. And this is also another book uh, by Presto Hokusai. And uh, this is the, what most people would argue is the earliest known impression that is um, in an institution. This is the one that's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And um, it's probably the earliest. Um, I don't think I've come across another one or that was earlier. And, um, and so as a print, uh, because there's multiples, um, one of the joys of collecting prints is being able to examine each impression and compare them to other impressions. And so when you're dealing with famous works like Hokusai's Great Wave, there's thousands of impressions out there. And many of them are in books, and you get to compare the nuances of printing and how different they can be. So I'm going to hold the page at an angle um, to prevent the glare from my um, overhead light, and I just want to point out some things. Number one, what makes this a razor-sharp early impression, just at first blush, is look at these lines. Look at the lines in the cartouche. Look how sharp those lines are. There is a break. There are several breaks, but there's a famous break at the lower left. There should be a break right around here for later impressions. Um, and when I say later, still Edo period, but this print was so popular that it was produced in huge quantities. And so the, the blocks wore down and the fine lines, you know, were the first ones to be affected by it. And the finest lines on this print are the, the lines around the cartouche. And so just quickly, I'm going to refer to one where you see the lines breaking. Um, actually, right here, there's this big, huge gap. And then, of course, there's the loss of this line at the bottom. And there's just this, this larger area of that's not printed. And that's just the, the, the color block not being sort of um, in registration with this lower line. There's some warping going on in, in those blocks. So you get the, that sort of misprinting there. And moving back to the original or the earlier version, not original, they're all original. Uh, the earlier version, you, you see none of that. And so what's interesting is on this impression, this is an in-between impression. This is not the earliest impression, like the, the Met example. But you could see that the lines are pretty much there. There's some, there's some light breaks in the, in the cartouche. But generally speaking, the lines are there. That tells us that in terms of this impression, it's, it's pretty early, you know? And, <coughs> excuse me. The, the other lines, there's some other breaks that, you know, we could discuss throughout the, the, the print. And I'll, I'll save those nuances um, because we, we could go down that rabbit hole um, and discuss those nuances for hours and hours. I'll just point out a few other things I think are interesting. The, the background in the sky, there is this cloud here. And this cloud at one point was kind of a yellowish pink. And uh, this, this impression still retains some of that pigment. So you, you kind of see the, the area where the cloud is. It's not really pink anymore, but you still see a little bit of the yellow. And here, that black, I mean, that block has worn down, and you don't even see it here. Um, of course, the, that block being one of the, the blocks that's most susceptible to fading because that that pinkish color was so sensitive to light, but you don't you don't see any of it. 
there. And on, on my impression here, you, you see it. You can make it out. I have to kind of move the back a little bit. Um, and in this, this really bright light, there's this light right overhead. Um, it's really bright, and it doesn't really allow us to look so carefully. But, <coughs> excuse me, I'm still fighting a cold. Um, you could see that the, the sky, the, the cloud is kind of there. It's still kind of there. And in, in better light, uh, I assure you, it's, it's more noticeable. But that's kind of interesting to note uh, that. Um, and then one other point I'll make is the Bokashi that is around Mount Fuji, that's a very light printing here. You could barely make out the Bokashi around Mount Fuji. Here, it's very much pronounced. And it, it goes above Mount Fuji, almost in a sweeping sort of uh, pattern and movement up following the contours of the, the, uh, the wave. And here, you see the Bokashi, the darker part here and the lighter part there. So you see basically the outline of the block ending right where the top of Mount Fuji is. So you see that much more pronounced here. You see that there, but on the a very late impression, <clears throat> that's kind of missing. And, you know, again, we can discuss all these nuances from one impression to another, to another. And as a collector of, of prints, particularly if, if you're interested in ukiyo-e, I will, I want to encourage you to become familiar with what the earliest printings look like. Now, for a great wave, uh, in a first state like that, or really early, this is, you know, millions of dollars, probably. I mean, one recently sold at Christie's that was pretty early for about a million dollars. And so this impression being I, I, the best one would be at least double that. But, you know, these nuances help us. Um, because there are a lot of great waves out there that are original, but have these huge breaks here and, and within the, the other blocks. And they're, they're actually accessible um, for some collectors. They're, they're, they're not even hundreds of thousands of dollars. You, they used to sell for ten to 20000 um, just a few years ago. And I would say they, they're not at the five, ten, twenty thousand dollar range, but they're certainly under a hundred thousand. Um, some of them that, that I've come across. So to become familiar with each impression, it, you, it allow you to quickly, um, you know, quickly sum up the, 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 the quality of the impression and whether a print is worthwhile. Now, of course, the Great Wave is the most famous example in ukiyo-e. But if you're interested in Hiroshige, if you're interested in Utamaro, there are there are prints that are being sold in at auctions that often fetch big prices, but aren't really worth those prices because the buyers aren't familiar with the the idea of the the impression. They just see a design by a famous artist and they, and they say, oh, I have to have it. So this is when having um, a good reference library, that uh, a library that focuses on prints that you're interested in, that it will help you reinforce your knowledge so you know you could critique and you could um, quickly figure out what type of impression you have, um, either in front of you or for sale, either at a gallery or in an auction. Other th nuances about this print that are really neat is that this print shows a full margin. And for those of you that collect ukiyo-e prints, you'll know that is very rare. You'll see here at the bottom, there is margin. There's an unprinted portion here. So that's a full sheet. Typically, these prints were trimmed so that they fit in albums and um and then you know they were mounted in these albums so that you could flip through these books and look at all your prints 
But in this particular case, this print at some point was in an album, but it's been removed um, a long time ago. And the album was an oversized deluxe album. So the entire print, the entire image is all there, which is great. On here, you don't see that. And you could see that the print was trimmed into the image. And in fact, if I compare this image with this, there might be a little bit missing in the image. Um, you know, we, we I would have to, here, maybe we could compare it quickly. No, it seems like it's all there. Uh, I would say that's pretty much all there. But um, having having the the margins on a print like this is is just a wonderful thing to have. It it certainly increases the value of the impression. So for those of you that collect other you know other artists in in, in the ukiyo-e school, you know having margins on a print is just great. Really, really great, especially the prints by Hiroshige and Hokusai, who you normally don't see margins on these 36 views of Mount Fuji. So it's a treat when you do. Um, and, you know, just, again, I want to zoom in so you could look at the print. And I'll do one last thing. This is not something ordinarily, something you come across, but for collectors of prints, one of the things, one of the joys is being able to examine the, the reverse of a uh, work. You could see the bleed through. You could also see the the work that was going gone into printing it. This is the the lines you get from the baran that's used, the circular bamboo instrument that's used to rub the print against the block. So imagine that this sheet of paper is the block of wood, and the the print is resting on the block of wood. The the printer would take that circular bamboo device and and just you rub against the piece of paper and these are the lines you would get when the pigment was bleeding through so th this is a really wonderful artifact from the printing process that shows you the print is not just original but also of the period this is something you would see on ukiyo-e prints um, later reproductions even 20th century reproductions are printed on a thicker type of paper that rarely you see the evidence of printing. So uh, th this type of paper is Edo period paper. It's very absorbent, but it's not as thick. So that's why you get th those uh, printing effects. Also, when you have uh, prints, uh, sometimes they come from important collections. And this particular impression of the Great Wave was once in a museum and there's some museum stamps on the back of the print. And and so, you know, you could look at it and it's very clean. There's no tape um, remnants, there's no staining, but it, it was in fact once in a, in a book, Japanese style book. So what probably happened, because these stamps really do tell a story, I think what happened is that the print was removed from the bound album at the museum, and once it was removed, they added the stamps on the verso. So that's probably what happened. But I just want to zoom in so you can kind of see, you know, the 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 back of the Great Wave. All right, now one more time we'll flip it over. And a 
couple one one more time over the the very early first states that is um, at the Mets. And this is another uh, impression much later with the cartouche being broken and the printing just doesn't pop. It's a little soft. The edges are all soft because the blocks have worn down uh, quite a bit. So you can see the difference between this impression with how sharp this impression is and the sharpness of this impression as well. So that, that gives you an idea of, of the differences you get in, in printing. And these are all um, Edo period printing. I'll finish up this conversation with one other sort of um, observation I've made. There is a late Edo, probably early Meiji impression of this great wave out in the world. You see it. Uh, there's a few in museums. And, and the wave, I mean the wave, the, the, the cloud is bright pink. It's like a pink color. And a lot of collectors have asked me, oh, that one retains the pink. It's the earliest. And that's actually not true. The, the, the printing of that pink color was actually, it's from the Meiji period. And it has that Meiji color pink. That, you know, for all of us that are familiar with the Meiji colors, it's not as soft and subtle as Edo period pink. It's a brighter, harsher pink. And that pink that is in the sky that was done later, that pink is much more stable than the Edo period pink, which is really fugitive. So when you see that great wave with the pink, Chances are those that impression's even later, uh, late Edo, early Meiji impression, and these blocks were used over and over and over again. Um, to my knowledge, they they don't exist, um, and they're not being reproduced. Uh, prints aren't being reproduced now, but they were used uh, certainly throughout the Edo period into the Meiji period, <coughs> and then this print was done originally about 1830. So just imagine um, from 1830 to, you know, the Meiji period in the late 1800s, 30, 40 years of printing, you know, they were, they, who knows how many they made, but the, the estimate is, is tens of thousands of impressions. So that's how you get the, the, the wear on the blocks. And a late impression is going to have breaks on the wave. Certain, the parts of the cartouche are completely gone. The breaks in the, in the signature here. Um, and then, of course, other blocks are different. And, the, and this goes, uh, you, you could say this about all Edo period prints. As the blocks wore down, publishers used darker colors, um, to hide or mask the fine lines that have broken off. So um, here, the colors certainly are different um, from the, the Meiji period uh, printing, and, um, and they're more subtle. So the, this blue is a little lighter than that blue or the, the impression on, on this. And you're going to find a lot of different um, nuances, particularly surrounding um, different colors used on different um, impressions based on the, the, the time the print was, was done. So any, pr any print was, is either early, middle, or late. And the colors used are one of a few things you, you can use to help you figure out where that impression lies within the production. So, you know, I hope seeing this print compared to these two prints in particular in different books um, kind of help um, get a sense of the, how wood black prints were made and how many were made and the, the types of wear that you see on blocks. And that'll help your collecting. That'll help you identify earlier impressions from later. Oh, and one other thing before I go. On some prints, not, not this one in general, but early Hiroshige, but certainly early, um, um, yeah, early Hiroshige's, some hokus size, but certainly early Hiroshige have a wood grain um, and a lot of designs. And that wood grain 
screams early printing. And we'll talk about that in the future, about certain designs that have wood grains. This design never really had a strong wood grain, though the Red Fuji, one of the top designs from this series, does. And we could talk about that another day. Uh, but anyway, uh, let me flip the video over. I want to thank all of you for joining me uh, and on this very late edition of Woodblock Wednesday, where every Wednesday we get together and discuss Japanese prints. Um, and culture. And so I'll be doing some more traveling in the coming weeks, but I hope to do these videos even while I'm traveling uh, without interruption. So there's a lot of wonderful things uh, happening. Um, uh, please check out my website, collectingjapaneseprints.com. You'll find reference books, you'll find original Japanese prints from all genres, uh, like, like this Hokusai Great Wave, which uh, uh, was available. I think it's reserved for someone. But, you know, I, I get a very important, high-quality prints, so please have a look. Um, and, of course, feel free to shoot me an email or a comment on any of the videos with questions or comments. So thanks again for joining me. See you soon.